Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. No one thinks we have the balls to pull this off. Okay, girls. Let's go get them. No place like home. Hello, I'm Anna Smith and this is Girls on Film with the BFI at Home. Today we discuss diversity in ability on screen. I'll be talking to an actor and a director who've recently made industry headlines with their work around casting actors with disabilities. The film industry doesn't have a great track record when it comes to representation on screen. The first major film to feature actors with disabilities was way back in 1932, when the controversial Freaks used real-life sideshow performers. The actor Harold Russell, a double amputee, won the Oscar for Best Actor in 1946 for The Best Years of Our Lives. But it wasn't until 40 years later that the deaf actress Marley Matlin won for The Children of a Lesser God. Marley Matlin. Marley Matlin! I'm not a, much of a speaker. He is. <laughs> Children of a Lesser God was also the first female-directed film to be nominated for Best Picture. But these are exceptions to the rule. 27 able-bodied actors have won awards for playing characters with disabilities, from Daniel Day-Lewis for My Left Foot to Eddie Redmayne for The Theory of Everything. And it's not just about Oscars. The new film Come As You Are recently attracted criticism for casting able-bodied actors in the lead roles. The majority of these roles still routinely go to actors who are famous and don't have a disability. While they might be amazing performers, is this really fair on actors with disabilities who are struggling to even land an audition for a role? The conversation around this is getting louder, and rightly so. Shortly I'll be talking to the Oscar-nominated Australian actor-turned-director Rachel Griffiths. But first I'll be chatting to Ruth Maidley, who's appeared in TV shows including Fresh Meat, Cold Feet, Don't Take My Baby, and Years and Years. For years and years, Russell T Davis actually reshaped the role of Rosie so that he could cast Ruth, who's a wheelchair user. Ruth's latest work is a short film called Verisimilitude. It's part of the Uncertain Kingdom collection. She plays an actor who's struggling to get work and is ironically training an able-bodied actor to play a person with disabilities. So you need to learn how to do a wheelie. Find your centre of gravity, OK? That's the key to everything. Like this? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. <gasps> it's very funny, but it makes a serious point. I asked Ruth what attracted her to the role. The first time I read the script, I fell in love with it, and I've known um, our director, David Proud, for quite a long time, and he was on my bucket list of people who I really wanted to work with. And I really fell in love with the script, and it's a, it's a topic that I feel really passionately about, and I thought the script handled it in such a way that it was funny, it was awkward, it was a really lovely way to tell a really important point, so uh, it was lovely, lovely job to do. Bella, love. I want to bring Josh. I've heard you've done a bit of acting. Yeah, it's what I do most, actually. Oh, great, because we've lost one of our wheelies to an advert. One of the soldiers for the hospital scene tomorrow. Uh, send me a couple of lines. You up for it? I mean, if we get a girl who's also handicapped, then it ups our diversity quota for the BFI. I mean, they're all just white, able-bodied blokes. thing is, I've been disabled since birth. They've all got acquired disabilities. It's completely different. Doesn't matter. Don't care. The audience don't give a shit either. OK, then. What could I do? Well, I'll get you on the call sheet. Would you like to elaborate why you think it's important that people with disabilities play those kind of roles? The, the conversation regarding disability representation has been going on far longer than I have been in the industry. I've been doing this like four and a half, five years, and I'm exhausted talking about it. So goodness knows how how all the other guys feel um, 
having to have this conversation over and over again. That what if there's a level playing field, that's a different conversation, but there isn't. The actors with disabilities still get marginalised at every single term. We're told we need a name for this project. There aren't. A, there's, there isn't a disabled name. A disabled person can't sell the story, so we need to put an able-bodied person in a disabled role to make it sell to get the point across. And if we keep, if execs and people high up keep using that excuse and then critics keep applauding it as good representation, then people who have disabilities who are equally, if not more talented, are just gonna be continually overlooked. I would never want to get a role just because I'm disabled. And that's, that's definitely not what this conversation is about. It's more along the lines of, get me in the room. If I'm not good enough for the job, that's a different conversation. And that happens all the time. We're actors, that happens every single day 90 percent of roles you go for you don't get <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it's not something we're not gonna be offended if we don't get it because we're not good enough i'm offended if i don't get in the room because of my disability are there any films or tv shows that you feel from the past have portrayed disability well and responsibly i mean you've been in some great ones <laughs> um for, for me i remember on i'm an ambulatory wheelchair user so that means that i can walk as well and I'd never seen until I watched EastEnders with Lisa Hammond in it, I'd never seen a disabled character be out walking in her own house, out of her wheelchair and just moving around as, as she would a normal day life, you know? And that really stuck with me. I was like, I was, I think I was in my late twenties when I saw that, mid to late twenties. I was like, I'm like 26. How have I never seen an ambulatory wheelchair user? on TV before. So when we did Years and Years, I was really passionate about using my ambulatory wheelchair user kind of status, if you like, as, as a way to really show this is how I move and I shouldn't be worried about, I'm constantly told you're gonna confuse the audience if you walk in one minute and then you're not the next. Well, get confused then. <laughs> There's, the, you know what, there's so many, sadly, just not enough of them are on the mainstream. And I think Lisa stood out so much because it was the mainstream. I am absolutely obsessed with James Moore in, in Emmerdale. I love him so much. He is such a fantastic character. He is so talented. It, the storyline has very, very rarely been related to his disability. He's gorgeous, he's talented. And so those kind of things are really needed in the mainstream, I feel. You also worked, as you mentioned, with David Proud, who's a director with disabilities. How did that inform the film and your relationship with him working? You know what, David, I mean, I say this, but he's definitely the first wheelchair user I've ever, first director wheelchair user I've ever worked with. And I, I didn't expect that to make such a difference, but it really did. Like I felt almost braver in my approach to the role and I knew that he had certain expectations as a disabled filmmaker and that just made it made me want to do better and I think he's such a talent anyway in acting writing in in directing he's, he's got he's so he's like a three-pronged attack he's one of those really irritating people that's good at everything so for, for me it was really great to be able to work with him closely and really tell this important story and argue our case in a really creative, fun way. The film also shows how thoughtlessly people can behave and speak um, about being able-bodied. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but did this ring true for you? I will always forever, I'm, I'm forever the optimist. I don't believe I've ever been in a situation where people have said things maliciously. I don't think it's done out of, mal out of malicious intent. And I think a lot of things come from fear. People don't mean things in a nasty way, but it just shows how archaic language is regarding disability. And it's really great to be asked these kinds of questions because you can have our conversations and educate people and really highlight certain types of ableist language. People with disabilities, doesn't it doesn't mean that you're unhealthy. It doesn't mean that you're poorly. All of that kind of language where your wheelchair or your disability is seen as a hindrance. Yeah. Those kind of words and that kind of language is, is still really prevalent and which is why it's really important to kind of highlight that and call it out and hopefully change, change it. 
what can we do as audiences? I love it when people ask me questions about this kind of stuff. I love it when people say, is this the right term to use? And I can say, yep. Yeah, I mean, and, and it all is subjective. Some people get really offended by certain terms and other people don't mind them. So it is subjective to a certain point. But I would always encourage people to ask questions. Keep the dialogue open. Don't be afraid to watch something or back something or and support something just because you're not 100% sure of the political correctness of it. Um, so that that for me is, is just not being afraid to have the conversation and ask questions. Verisimilitude is available to watch as part of the Uncertain Kingdom collection now. It's a great selection of short films, I really recommend them. A different perspective on this issue comes from my next guest, Rachel Griffiths, the actor who turned director after decades of roles in everything from Six Feet Under to Muriel's Wedding. Her character in Muriel's Wedding, Rhonda, becomes a wheelchair user during the story. You're right, you are a new person. And you stink. Muriel Van Arkel stinks. And she's not half the person Muriel Heslop was. Rhonda! <laughs> Your mum just told us you're moving back to Pauper Spit. Oh, it'll be just like old time. Don't worry about Rhonda, Mrs E. We'll push her around. <laughs> In Rachel's film, Ride Like a Girl, Teresa Palmer plays Michelle Payne, who is the first female jockey to win the coveted Melbourne Cup. Rachel actually cast Michelle's real-life brother, Stevie, who has Down syndrome, as himself. I think sometimes stories, you know, choose you and you don't choose them. When I came across this story, 2015, I'm at a barbecue, a Melbourne Cup Day, which is a national holiday for us, go figure. And that day just blew open my mind because I'm watching the race and at the um, 300 metre mark, the race caller said Michelle Payne. And I just, just, just like, I was like, what? There's a girl racing, girls are jockeys. And 20 seconds later, she wins the you know, longest, toughest, richest prize in the world, first woman to do so. And by the time she dismounted, I had already found out that she lost her mother at eight months old. She was the youngest of 10 children, seven girls uh, who had ridden, um, six before her. Her older sister had died after a terrible fall. Father was a trainer. The horse is 100 to one, owned by a bunch of blokes from the bush you know, riding against the chic and the best English and Irish horses. And it just, it was the great underdog story. I watched the girls in the room because my daughters were there. A lot of, you know, girls from eight to 16 and they were all like cheering and screaming when Michelle won. And I thought, this is a really extraordinary moment. It is an, a story you could never make up. As a, as a lover of the sports genre, we haven't really made the great sports film. So I thought, I think this might be it. It's what we're talking about on Girls on Film often, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. And to see yourself 100%. reflected on screen. And yeah. Exactly. And this is a walk in her shoes film, but for my purpose, like content, it is a, it, I wanted to do a film that talked to that. I've had women come up to me in the supermarket and they're like, oh, ride like a girl. We loved it. We loved it. I took my three daughters. One of them wants to be a jockey. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, but then I've had other men come up to me and just say, you know, my daughter suddenly wants to come to the track with me. And what an incredible joy it is to, you know, to share a lifetime of love that they may have, you know, been a father-son thing when they were young. Um, that their daughters now can kind of see that girls at the track aren't just about fascinators. You know, they're, they're as mm -hmm. trainers, that they're, they're as jockeys, that they're, they're as owners, that they're, they're as breeders. Um, and, and women are becoming a lot more prominent in that industry. And um, yeah, I hope uh, everyone who sees this show watches the film because it is incredibly uplifting and um, a beautiful film to share with all ages. It's a PG feminist sports film to make men cry. That was my pitch. <laughs> I want to ride group ones. I want to be the best. A big moment for Michelle Payne. Settle down, like your sisters. He's stubborn and selfish. Maybe he didn't want to lose another one of his girls. I want to ride with different trainers. No. Do as I say, little girl. I'm not your little girl. I think she might need a manager. She's got great balance. Yes, she. Do you think it's all about strength? It is about so much more than that. 
Can I do this? I know the host can. You've got to be a champion. What you doing after the race? Celebrating. Um, in, in real life, uh, Michelle's brother has Down syndrome and you yeah. cast two actors with Downs as Stevie at different stages of his life, including Stevie herself. Brilliant. That's Thank right. You. Can you talk us through that casting process? Look, I had, um, I did have another actor in the back of my mind for Stevie who is absolutely extraordinary. He, of course, has Down syndrome, it was never in my mind that you would cast that any other way. But the difficulty in using him is that it would have been really hard to showcase Stephen's professional skills. So, um, so Stevie Payne was the strapper of a very difficult horse. This, um, the Prince is quite a piece of work, <laughs> very spirited, very um, flighty, um, very unpredictable. Um, and I thought it was really important not just um, to have, you know, inclusive, you know, inclusivity on our screen, but to actually showcase that that day, you know, the best two on track were a woman and a man who happens to have Down syndrome. They were the best at their job in that race on that day. And so uh, it was just so important to me that you could see his talent with the horses um, because he's like a horse whisperer and I saw him with the prince and um, I mean I find I found the prince quite terrifying and he would just talk to him and it just you know he'd go from really rearing up to, to settling down so when I heard that Stephen wanted to play himself I was like oh well that could be good um, and of course the gift of him was that he was always able to us to inform us on set what something was like or you know what Michelle would have done or what Paddy you know how Paddy was feeling on this particular day um, and young Griffin who had never been on screen before just absolutely loved it I mean I had people texting me when the film was in cinemas here and you know we were the number one film of the year down here in Australia and people were like, oh my God, I'm in an audience and there are 10 different families with their Down syndrome brother, you know, their brothers or other family members with Down syndrome and everybody's just coming out beaming. Um, and I think what this film has really done is show what an incredible asset um, people who we may think can't do certain jobs, what an incredible asset that they are in a workplace culture, how they change the culture and how they can be really, really good at their job. Ride Like a Girl is available to rent on all major digital platforms now and on DVD from the 10th of August. Thanks to Rachel and Ruth for joining us today and to the BFI for partnering with Girls on Film. In lockdown, the BFI have been working harder than ever to bring films into your homes. So please do show your support for the BFI by making a donation. You can give £5 by texting BFI at home to 70085. Text costs £5 plus one standard message rate. We'll be talking more about diversity and ability on future podcasts. And you can hear longer versions of the conversations we've had today by subscribing to Girls on Film on your usual pod provider. The link's below the screen right here. Thanks for watching Girls on Film. We'll be back in a fortnight. Hope to see you then.